good to us. Let's go to Joshua chapter 3 tonight. Joshua chapter 3 starting at verse number 1. I love one particular verse in this because I don't know that it's ever mentioned anywhere else in the Bible but it is something to help the child of God to walk by faith, live by faith and to trust God every step of the way. There are those things in our life that we really want spelled out. Amen? Like car loans, home mortgages, doctors. Don't ever try to read your doctor's notes unless they have somebody else type it out. Because I'm telling you, I do believe they have got their own language. Somebody say amen. You know what I'm talking about. You ever look at the prescription that they hand write out? I'm telling you, I think they finally are making them type it out because even the pharmacists aren't sure what they're giving you. There are just some things that we won't spell out, and I get that, but there are some things that God requires us to accept by faith. I don't know everything about God. I don't know everything about what he has planned or set up. I know many things, but I know there are some things that God keeps to himself because he knows we can't handle it. And yet he says, trust me. And if we'll trust him, he'll bring us through. In Joshua chapter 3, I want to read to you about the situation following after the death of Moses and Joshua taking on as the new leader of Israel. If you're ready, let's go with it. Joshua arose early in the morning and they set out from Acacia Grove and came to the Jordan, talking about the river, he and all the children of Israel and lodged there before they crossed over. And so it was after three days that the officers went through the camp and they commanded the people saying, when you see the ark of the covenant of the Lord your God and the priest, the Levites, bearing it, then you shall set out from your place and go after it. And yet there shall be a space between you and it, about 2,000 cubits by measure, and you do not need to come near it that you may know the way by which you must go. Here it is. For you have not passed this way before. Joshua said to the people, sanctify yourselves. For tomorrow the Lord will do wonders among you. And then Joshua spoke to the priest saying, take up the ark of the covenant and cross over before the people. And so they took up the ark of the covenant and went before the people. Again tonight, I just want to speak to you about a way we've never gone before. Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, help us tonight, God, to minister this. God, I couldn't get away from this. I tried, God, but I just, I had to come back to it, God, and I'm so glad that I did. And I'm so glad that you put into my heart and my spirit and my mind, God, what you want shared tonight. And I pray, God, that in Jesus' name, God, that you'll help me to share it, God, Lord, completely. And Father, we're going to trust you with it and believe you for it, for it's in Jesus' mighty name. And everybody said, amen and amen. Be afraid. I got one page. That's all I got. Not three, four, five, or a hundred. I got one page. You better pray hard. Amen. The Bible tells us that there's more to this story than what I've read in your hearing. Two spies were sent from Jericho or sent to Jericho from Acacia Grove to do reconnaissance for Israel when they began to take over or try to take over the area known as Jericho, the city known as Jericho. These men came to the house of a harlot named Rahab. Remember that name. It's important. 
strangers going into the home or the house of a heart. It wouldn't draw a lot of attention to a lot of the local people, but somebody recognized the way they dressed and somebody recognized the way they talked and somebody recognized that they had some ways about them that just said, y'all ain't from around here, are you? And so they told the king of Jericho, there are men, two men, we believe they are spies for Israel. They had already heard that Israel was in the area. In fact, they had already heard the story told how that Israel had crossed over on the bottom of the Red Sea and they crossed over on dry ground, not muddy water, not in ankle deep water, but they crossed over on dry ground. Why? Because God scooped it all back until he got down to the dry stuff and kept the waters back while they made their way across to the other side. They also heard that they had come upon two kings who were notoriously evil, who were absolutely ruthless, and they took both of them down, Sion and Og. With names like Sion and Og, you might expect them to be needing killing, but they did take care of them because why? They were part of the Amorites that God had promised 400 years earlier that I'm going to judge the Amorites, and when I do, they've had their chance. They can repent any time they want, but if they don't, I'm going to judge them and they're going to give up the land and that's just exactly what they did. They died and gave up the land and Israel proclaimed it, took possession of it and was holding on to it for the sake of the fact that God had promised it to them 400 years earlier to Abraham. When the word got out to the king there in Jericho. They sent people to the house of this woman. This woman said, yeah, I saw them but they left from here. They did. They left from there and went up on her roof. I thought maybe she had lied to them, but she did not. She sent them up to the rooftop there and, and these men looked around and they found stacks of flax that they would take and put on a spinning wheel and utilize it for the purposes of trying to put together all kinds of things with that flax. And lo and behold, they could not find them. They didn't pull the stacks of flax away. And can I just tell you something? If you ever come into a situation where you're looking for something and you happen to come up on a stack of flax, attack the stack. Somebody say Amen. Because there's something hiding in there that you're trying to find. Amen, amen, and amen. They came back and they said to her, we didn't see anybody up there. She said, no, you better hurry. She said, I think they're heading down the road. They're going back from where they came. And you better go before they close the gates to the city. And so the men hurried from her place, went down the stairs, got to the gate, got outside. And before they knew it, the men had already gotten themselves ready to leave. But now they can't go. The gates of the city are closed up. And they're closed up tight. They've heard about Israel. They know what's going to happen. They're aware that if Israel shows up, they don't stand a chance. Why? Because God's already taken care of the Red Sea and God's already taken care of Sion and Og and God has made them a promise that they are going to possess the land. Oh, hallelujah to God. Well, how are we going to get out of here? And the woman said, I'll tell you what, I'll make an oath with you that if you'll take care of me, you'll take care of my mama and my daddy, you'll take care of my brothers and my sisters, you'll take care of their spouses, you'll take care of their children, that when y'all come in and take this town down, you will not do us any harm. He said, you got a deal. They begin to talk about that covenant that they were making, that oath that they were taking. He said, now, if you, if you renege on your promise and you do turn us in and you help them to find us, we're clear. We're going to kill you. And they said, may we be killed if we renege on our part. So we're holding one another to this oath that we will not turn the other one in. As long as your family stays in your house, hear me. As long as your family stays in your house, can I tell you the family of God needs to come into the house of God and stay in the house. Somebody shout amen anytime now. You get in the house, stay in the house, then nothing will happen to you and nobody will touch you. And if they do, we'll take care of them. We'll take care of them if they spill your blood. But anybody that dares to go out of your house, once they get in here, to them, they are fresh meat. They will be up and available to be slaughtered. I'm here to tell you, she agreed, they agreed, everybody agreed. She lets them down with a cord, a rope, if you will, from the window that she has that sits on the city wall to the outside. 
She lets these two men scurry down. They rappel down the wall there and they make their way for the mountains. They hide for three whole days, eluding the men who are trained to find them. I believe God covered their tracks. I believe that God prevented them from leaving any sign that they had been any particular direction. And when they returned to Jericho, then those men made for the Acacia Grove just as quick as they could. They got there and they went to Joshua right off the bat and said, look, we can take it. Not because of us, but because of God. Can I tell you something? You'll never take the Jericho of your life on your own. You'll never take the Jericho and bring it down on your own. You're going to have to depend upon God. And he said, but look, we made a deal. We made a deal with a woman by the name of Rahab. She's a harlot. Yeah, we know. Don't go there. Leave it alone. Lo and behold, we told her that we would protect her. We would protect her mama and her daddy. We'd protect her brothers and her sisters. We'd protect their spouses. And we would protect their children as long as they all stayed in her house. Can I tell you that even the families of harlots do not want to stay with the harlot? Hello? But the truth of the matter is, there was safety in her house. There was security in her house. There was assurance in her house. There was salvation. Can you imagine God taking the home of a harlot, of a whore, of a hooker, of a streetwalker? You're not hearing what I'm talking about here tonight. Uh, of a lady of the evening. Are you listening to what I'm saying? She lived in the red light district and they went there and God turned her place into a place of refuge. God turned her place into a house of worship because I guarantee you, honey, that's exactly what they were going to be doing. They were going to be found worshiping the God of all Israel. Listen to what she said to them. Plain and simple, she made it clear to them, you need to know and understand when we heard what happened at the Red Sea and we heard what happened to Sion and Og, listen, our hearts melted. You know when we hear that today? Some romantic chick flick. Oh. They said, when we heard how you victoriously came through the Red Sea, when the word got to us that Sion and Og were not victorious over you, but you were victorious over them and killed them, our hearts melted. Listen, she goes on further and she says very simply, our courage was gone. You want to know why? Thank you for asking. For the Lord your God, I'm quoting her, for the Lord your God, he is God in heaven above and on earth beneath. Honey, they've got a convert. God has converted this harlot. God has turned this woman's life around. She's got faith in God. She's got a testimony for God. I know my God can do it. To him there's nothing to it. He'll see you through it, sweet victory. Somebody say amen. She understood that God was fighting for them and there was nothing they could do. So after they were safely released and they got from Jericho, hid in the mountains for three days, returned to Acacia Grove, talked to Joshua, Joshua began to do something. The Bible said Joshua had them move from Acacia Grove over to the banks of the Jordan River. Now listen, they are on the east side of the Jordan River. They have gone through the Sinai Peninsula, they've gone through the wilderness, and they've come back around. When we say they went in circles, I'm not kidding. They could have just gone straight over, but no, they wouldn't believe God. They wanted to go back to Egypt. They wanted cucumbers and leeks and onions, oh my. You could smell them coming from a half a mile away. Amen. There's just so much you can do with leeks and cucumbers and onions, amen. Sounds like a salad bowl to slavery to me. God had them wander around for 40 years. Kept them the whole time. Kept them fed with manna from above. Kept them fed with quail meat in the morning time. Kept their sandals from wearing out. Kept them from having to worry about their clothes wearing out. God kept them for 40 years. But when that 40 year period was up, they found themselves on the other side of the Jordan River. They found themselves on the east side. Not on the west side like they needed to be. So he moves them. He moves them going west. Kind of a, more like a southwest direction. He takes them down to the fords of the Jordan River and they camp there. Well, how are we going to get across? Look at that river. 
the river is swollen. They have had some massive rainfalls. They are having flash flooding. I mean, it's beginning to look like places in Tennessee and Georgia when they've had a big old rain come through there. The river is out of its banks by hundreds of yards. The, the people see this. Can you imagine the people coming up over a rise and looking and seeing the Jordan River swollen? Well, how are we going to get across that? So they go down so far and they set up camp. No doubt realizing the people felt like they did and what they were talking about, he comes along and he begins to talk to them. He says after they were there for three days, he instructed them to stay back from the Ark of the Covenant at least a 1,000 yards. That's our terminology, 2,000 cubits, if you will. Somewhere between a half a mile and four-fifths of a mile. Can I tell you something? When you're up on an elevated area, you can see a pretty good little bit in that distance. All they could see was swollen river. All they could see was a river that was flooded. All they could see was that it was out of its banks and it was wider than it normally is. How are we going to get across? And he speaks to them. He said, listen, you need to understand something. You're going to follow the Ark of the Covenant. The Ark of the Covenant for them represented the presence of the Lord. The Ark of the Covenant had three things on the inside. It had the second set of tablets of stone that had the Ten Commandments on it. It had a pot that had, still has, by the way I might add, had and still has some of that manna that fell from heaven above. And there was on the inside that branch of the tree that was representation of the priesthood of Aaron. Lo and behold, the thing that was different about that twig was that it sprouted all kinds of almond plumes. Why? Because, friend, that stick wasn't dead, neither is the priesthood of God. Somebody say amen. Lo and behold, those three things are in there, and one day we will see them. I believe this with all of my heart. One day they'll find the ark, whether here or after Jesus comes, and we'll see what's on the inside of it, and we will rejoice and give God the glory for it all. But he tells them, you stay back now. You st we'll put it in southern lingo. You stay back about a half a mile now, you hear? Don't get any closer. You get too close, it could be trouble. I want you to watch this ark and I want you to see where it goes and I want you to realize that where it goes, you're gonna go. Why? Because you have not passed this way before. And then he says to them, listen to me, sanctify yourselves. Why? Very simply because beginning the next day, the Lord is gonna begin doing wonders in your midst. Can I tell you to be sanctified is not just about living a holy, godly life, but to be sanctified is to get yourself ready for God to do something powerful in your life. God help the church of God to get sanctified again to where he'll move powerfully in our midst and do mighty miracles and wonders. Not that we seek the miracles and wonders, but we seek the God who does the miracle and the wonders. We need to sanctify ourselves. We need to set ourselves apart holy unto God so that God God can do something great in our midst. If you believe that, say amen. amen. When the priest bearing the ark stepped into the Jordan River, very first miracle, all of a sudden the water began to back up, back up. I don't mean just stop, right? I mean it backed up. You want to know how far it backed up? It backed up almost 20 miles to a place called Adam. God's backing up the flow all the way to Adam. Somebody say amen. I'm here to tell you when he went to the cross, thanks be to God, he reached all the way back to Adam and he reached all the way forward to you and me. And thanks be to God, it might have been planted on the earth, but it was reaching up into heaven to let us know that God put a sacrifice that was going to take care of everything and everybody that had ever been born who would trust him and have confidence in him and have faith in his grace and his mercy to save them. Somebody help me here tonight, would you please? Those priests stepped in there. That water began to scroll back up the, up, upstream, if you will, about 20 miles to Adam. But the rest of it kept moving toward the Dead Sea. And it kept going and going. I'm telling you, it was an Energizer Bunny Rabbit moment. It kept going and going and going until it got to the Dead Sea. And you know what happened next? The ground dried up. They didn't have to wait around for days at a time for that muddy bank to get unmuddy. It turned 
dry. Just as soon as the water was pulled out, God sucked the water up out of the ground as well and they began to cross over on dry ground. But not until those priests got into the middle of what would have been the middle of the Jordan River. And when they got there, they stood there. They stood there. I said they stood there. What did they do? They stood there. How long? They stood there till they didn't need to stand there no more. And the people were able at that point to come by and as close as they could get was probably about as far as I am from Brother Roger. They couldn't get any closer. They absolutely came that close and they looked over because they had never seen the Ark of the Covenant. They had never had the privilege of being in the Holy of Holies. This was a place that only the Levites could be at, but now they walk by. God's presence is there. God's power is there. God's miracle is there. God's doing a work there. Why? They haven't come this way before. Somebody say amen. They've come in a way that they've never been before and now God is working like crazy. On dry ground they crossed. Bone dry ground. These people, 40 years earlier, maybe they were babies, maybe they were toddlers, maybe they were 40 year old adults, but now here they are 40 years later and some of them do not remember going through the Red Sea, they don't remember crossing, I don't know, how can you forget something like that, but many of them had forgotten some of us remember quote unquote when God used to, when God used to when God used to, well I want to tell you I believe that God still can, God still can, God still can what he did before he can do now I don't care what God did 40 years ago I'm telling you, God wants to do something now 40 years later. God's wanting to move again 40 years later. God wants you and me to stop looking back, stop looking in the rear view mirror and make up our mind and put our attention forward, put our eyes forward. Why? God's taking us somewhere we ain't never been before. Somebody say amen. amen. Listen to me. They forgot. Maybe some of them remembered, but most of them forgot. They forgot that then God took them away they had never. How many people take a tour through the, through the Red Sea? Oh, they get on a boat. They might get on one of those glass bottom boats so they can look through the bottom there and go, ooh, a fish. You know what I'd want to see if I took a Red Sea cruise, a tour? I want to see the chariot wheels. I want to see the chariots. I want to see the skeletons of the horses. Are you, you're not listening to me. I want to see the shields and I want to see the spears and I want to see all the swords and I want to see the headdress of the army that followed after Israel because, honey, they didn't make it over. They didn't make it through. They didn't cross over when they tried to do. Some folks think that they've, they've got the look. They, they've got the look. They, they get that look about them. They can do anything that the children of God do. I'm here to tell you, honey, you can't do what the children of God do because God is the one who does it for the children of God. And if you think you'll get by on your looks, on your abilities, on your strength, on your power, God's going to show you a thing or two and let you know you can't come this way. Somebody say amen. amen. Lo and behold, they got over on the other side, going a way that they had never gone before. Now they'd heard of Jericho. They knew about Jericho. They'd heard the walls were high and the walls were impenetrable. They heard that this place was a fortress. But honey, for them to get to the promised land, they got to go through Jericho, not around it. You're not hearing me. Some of y'all pray, oh, God, just, just divert it so I don't have to go through this anymore. Man, you ought to let God work in you and let you go through it because the testimony of going through it is far greater than the testimony of going around it. Say that again, Brother Nolan, I believe I will. I said the testimony of going through it with victory is far greater than the testimony of going around it. Well, aren't you concerned? Not a bit. I'm not afraid. I'm not afeard. Come on, shout with me. I'm here to tell you straight up, I've made up my mind. My God can take care of whatever I face. And if he says go through it, honey, I'll go through it and I'll come out the other end and everything's going to be, I'm not looking forward to trying to go through anything. But if I ever face a situation, I know that my God has not abandoned me. My God is still with me. My God will see me through it. Preach on, I believe I will. They'd heard of Jericho. They wanted to go around it. But God said you got to go through it. Why? So you can get to it. 
you got to go through it sometimes to get it. I'm going to say it again. you got to go through it sometimes to get it. They wanted the promised land. The promised land was theirs, but they had to go away. They had never gone before. I'm getting close to the end. Don't worry. Abraham was promised the land over 400 years earlier. They had never seen the land that was promised to Abraham. They had been in Egypt. Their mamas and daddies had died there. Their grandmas and grandpas had died there. Their great-grandmas and great-grandpas. Their great-great-grandmas and grandpas had died there. And here they are, 400 years later, going to a place they've never seen, going away they've never been before. Somebody say amen. Let me tell you something. God is leading you and he's leading me through all kinds of things by faith, through things that we've never ever had to deal with much before. And I'm here to tell you I'm not worried about those things, but in case you need a list, there's seven things that are mentioned in Romans chapter 8 and verse 35. He tells us that he'll take us through tribulation and he'll take us through distress. He'll take us through persecution. He'll take us through famine where we got a lean time going on. He'll take us through nakedness where we don't have any Thing. He'll take us through the peril of what's taken place. He'll take us through the sword. If you say, what do you mean? He says, will any of these things separate us from the love of God? No, sir. No, ma'am. No way. Jose, you need to understand that my God has promised he'll bring us through all seven of them. Why? He's taken us a way that we've never gone before. Others may have gone before, before us, but honey, we may not have, but yet our God has promised that he will be faithful. He cannot deny himself. He will take you through that way you've never been before. Somebody give the Lord some praise tonight. Our God is not leaving us. He's not forsaking us. He's going with us all the way through the way we've never been before. You never once hear the Lord say, well, you know, I don't recognize any landmarks around here. I don't recognize those buildings or those trees or that rock formation. I've never been this way. I, I'll just let you guys go on. You're walking by faith anyways. You'll figure it out. I may have told this before. We were in Florida. I forget why we got off the main road that we were traveling, but we got into an area and all of a sudden the signage did not line up. Didn't have a map. Wasn't no such thing called Siri or Alexa. I needed a map. And finally, wisdom hit me. The sun's going down. It sets in the west, as I recall. Let's just go the way that the sun is going. And so we followed the sun until we finally came back on to I-75. He said, that's stupid. Yeah. Should have had a map. Should have never got off the other road. But I didn't even know how to get back to that other road. I had turned so many different roads. My wife said, do you know where you're going? I said, no. I felt like Toucan Sam. I was following my nose. As long as I could see the sun. We got about an hour from sunset, and I'm like, God, you did it for Joshua. Would you do it for me? Don't let that sun go down too quick. We turned here and we found a main road and we turned again on another main road and finally we found I-75. And I don't know if she remembers it or not, but I let it out a collective. Whew. Boys are in the back seat. They don't have a clue. Thank God. My wife's sitting next to me. She's got lots of clues. Amen. But we got to where we were wanting to get to. And once we got there, we thanked the Lord that we made it. Simply put, sometimes you just got to trust God even when you go away that you've never 
been before. As I said, God won't leave you. God won't forsake you. Go ahead, brother, if you would. He's going to go with us through the way that we've never been before. And while we're walking by faith now, and I want to challenge you and encourage you, don't stop being faithful. There's a day coming. One day, not a weekend, not a week, not a month. One day, in fact, less than that. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, there is going to be a trumpet sound. You hear me? I mean, there will be no mistaking it. I, 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 literally, I literally was sitting in my office in Clarksville, Tennessee. Our church there is nowhere near railroad tracks. When all of a sudden I heard the bang, and I sat there. And I hollered for my secretary. I said, Rose, are you still here? Yes, pastor, what's wrong? I said, where's the railroad tax? She said, pastor, we're not near any railroad tax. Rose, you heard that horn, didn't you? She goes, yes, I did. She said, I'm pretty sure it's not what you thought it was. I said, why? She said, because I'm pretty sure it's not what I thought it was. She said, when I heard that, I thought, here we go. Does that sound like somebody's rapture ready? She heard a horn sound. I'm ready. Let's go. We laughed about it. We chuckled about it. But the truth of the matter is, in a little bit, we were both depressed because it wasn't that trumpet of God. Here's another way I know it wasn't because not only will there be the trumpet sound of God, there'll be the voice of the archangel who cries out. If there had been anybody in the church who knows I love a good joke, had been anywhere nearby and heard that horn, I guarantee you they would have gone, ah! And honey, I'm telling you, I'd have been jumping at that point. But here's the third reason why I know it wasn't. Because I didn't hear Jesus Christ call me up. You may fool me with a horn on a diesel train engine. You may fool me by giving me a, a Bigfoot yell. But you can't fool me when it comes to the voice of my Savior. You said, well, have you heard it? No, but something says I'm tuned in on the inside. And when the first two happen, the third one, lead, follow, or get out of the way. Because according to John 14 and 2, Jesus Christ has gone to prepare a place for me and you. And when that trumpet sounds and that archangel shouts and Christ himself calls us up. He's going to take every believer away and to a place we've never been before. And I can't hardly wait. Father, in Jesus' name, speak to us tonight. We've come through so much, Father. Some of us have dealt with battles, God, Lord, in our health and battles in our homes, battles on our jobs, God, Lord, even battles in the church. And we're weary. Maybe we're not as weary as the Israelites were after 40 years of wandering around in the wilderness. But God, we're not on the wrong side. We're just on the side that's waiting for you to return. You've promised us a place that you have especially prepared for us that when we get there, God, it'll feel like home. And all I ask is God help us, strengthen us, 
encourage us, motivate us, inspire us. Help us, God, to be faithful and to stay faithful and to encourage others to be faithful so that, Lord, we'll all hear that trumpet sound and we'll all hear the archangel shout and we'll all hear Jesus Christ call us up a little bit higher to a place that you've made for us, a place we've never been before and taking us in a way we've never been taken before. But oh God, we look expectantly to you tonight for that in Jesus' name. With every head bowed and every eye closed, listen to me. This isn't fantasy I'm talking about. This is reality. God, God is going to come and get us. I believe what they said about him. I believe that he was born and raised up in the town of Nazareth. I believe that he absolutely lived a sinless life. I believe that when he started his ministry three years later, they were so mad at him because he showed them the better way to live than the way they had been forced into of their own accord. I believe they arrested him. They beat him. They found him guilty of nothing, and yet they sentenced him to death. As I've said before, I say again, thank God he didn't take death lying down. On the third day, he got up, and when he did, he got up with victory over death and over hell, and as far as I'm concerned, over the grave as well. Amen. But that wasn't all. For 40 days, he instructed his believers, sharing with them, re-encouraging them, revealing more to them than they could ever hope or imagine until after 40 days, he arose and as he began to be overtaken by the very clouds that picked him up, two angels were dispatched to tell them, don't worry, this same Jesus that you just saw go away is coming back again. And he's going to take you away that you've never been before. If you're here tonight and you don't know Jesus, I'm begging you, please, don't let another moment go by. These altars are wide open, and you can come and pray and seek the Lord, and I'll be glad to pray with you, believe God together with you for you to receive him by faith. Or maybe you're here tonight, and the enemy of your soul has discouraged you and caused you to become despondent over nothing, tried to get you to turn your back upon him and turn away from God. I want to encourage you in the name of Jesus. Don't let him do it. The devil's a liar. If he's telling you it's no good and it's no use, he's lying to you. It is good and it is useful to let God help you and see you through. If you've got any other need and you want us to pray with you tonight, now's the time in the name of Jesus. If you're watching my live stream tonight, I'm asking you as well where you're at. You bow your head right there. I want to pray this prayer while they're coming up here to be prayed for. Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, whatever the needs are of those that are watching by live stream or watching by the rebroadcast, I'm asking you to touch and to minister and to move upon them, Father, in Christ's name. As their faith is turned loose into you, I pray, God, Lord, let the very power of God begin to flow on their behalf. Whatever it is they need, God, meet their need according to your riches and glory by Christ Jesus and help them, Father God to get in there one more time. Hold on just a little bit longer. It's going to be worth it all. In Christ's holy name we pray. Hallelujah to God.